committee will come to order. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Gates, uh, first question is for you. And uh, do, you have, do you have a date for the tanker decision? Sorry, Secretary Gates? No. Do you have a date for the tanker decision? Do you have a date for the tanker decision? No, but I would say uh, within the next um, two to three weeks, something like that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Admiral Mullen, your testimony, uh, written testimony discussed the pooled resources uh, idea. Your oral testimony actually gave it a title, and that's about as much right now as we have. Um, we've got total six twelve oh eight, and you both have testified yeah. even today about the need to uh, combine state and defense activities. Can you talk a little bit more about how you envision this collaborative pool resource idea and when we can expect to see actual language? Um, from, the, from, the, from my perspective, I think what has worked uh, with state, uh, between state and DOD is what I would call this dual key capability that uh, assigns responsibilities to Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, to both agree that we're going to spend the money a certain way. And I think that's reflective of the requirements we just see, which continue to emerge. I mean, it gets focused on Iraq and to some degree in Afghanistan, but it's really the preventive aspect of this, the, the investment ahead of time so we're, we're not in conflict. In great part to the special forces for us, for example, is one area, but we can't do it all, and that's really what this speaks to. I think in terms of, you know, the level of detail and proposal, uh, um, I mean, I, I think we can get that to you, you know, relatively quickly. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, the language is there right now. As I said, it's a $50 million initially with the, with the uh, um, uh, language. We'd like language which would allow us to reprogram an additional 450, you know, out of our own money uh, as needs emerge. Oftentimes, this is a speed issue. I mean, it, you know, as opposed to we need to do it now as these emerge as opposed to take months or maybe even a year. Well, do, then do you envision that you need additional authorities or you just need reprogramming authority? I think we need both. Okay. Uh, we'll need authorities for the 50 million and then, right. and then reprogramming money on top of that. Uh, and authority, then, sorry. And then authorities for, uh, for a, a structure, a decision structure right. as well? Right. Yeah, and, and we'll support provide. support for a decision structure. So right. you can so you can influence your colleagues and the other committee. The fifty million is the State Department contribution. The okay. larger number is ours. That was the the next question. I think it's important that um, both agencies have uh, skin in the game, if you will, to to make this work. And I think probably for it to work around here, it's going to have to look that way as well. Um, so uh, well, I look forward to some uh, actual language and, and help. Uh, from you all on that. The um, continuing resolution on the floor uh, today and the next day uh, includes a um, hit to the uh, Department of Energy's budget on nonproliferation of about 600 million, if I'm not mistaken, below the 011 request. Um, this is for nuclear nonproliferation. And this is the, the loose nuclear materials piece in addition to some other things, which is something that is in our jurisdiction as well. Can, can, have you, can you talk about or have you looked at what the impact of that, that hit will be on our ability? No, I haven't. You right. have not, okay. Um, can you, um, well, we only got a couple of days. I won't ask you to get back to me in the next two days uh, on that one because we're, we're voting presumably tomorrow on that, yeah. Um, can you speak though to the O12 requests uh, for the Department of Energy's nuclear non, the, the non-proliferation um, budget request as it applies to our jurisdiction? Uh, to be honest, Mr. Larson, the only part of the energy budget that I have any familiarity with is uh, for the NNSA stuff uh, yeah. on the nuclear weapons. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just not familiar. Well, p pieces of that is in NSA. So, okay, that's fine. Um, I think that, uh, can you then finally, um, Discuss the budget request, uh, perhaps Secretary Gates, here in the last uh, couple seconds, about uh, the, the budget request with regards to the phase adaptive approach for missile defense, um, supporting not only phase one, which started implementation this year, but what the budget request looks like for PAA on phases two through four, what kind of 
dollars are in there to, to continue moving this along? I, I can't parse the specific elements of it. I do know that the overall budget for missile defense is uh, going from 10.2 to 10.7 billion dollars, so we're putting another half a billion dollars into it. And there is money for more, e more Aegis ships, more of the uh, transportable radars like we have in Egypt, uh, like we have in uh, Israel and Japan right now. And, and then there are also uh, continuing investments in the ground-based interceptor system. So, so there's money in, as well as some of the high-level um, uh, technologies like uh, high-energy high lasers and precision tracking from space. So there, there's, a, there's a significant increase uh, in missile defense, including to be able to go forward with the uh, phased adaptive array in uh, defense in Europe. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you. Uh, thank you for your letter yesterday uh, in which you announced your support for a federal uniform standard uh, of custody protection for our men and women in uniform. Uh, I get to thank you on behalf of myself, this committee, the staff of this committee, and Eva Slusher from Kentucky, uh, who had lost her daughter in a custody battle as a result of a family law court a judge using her time of service against her in a custody battle that she ultimately won and got her daughter back. I know that you know that unfortunately throughout our country there are family law courts that, uh, where the judge will use the time away that someone has been deployed or even the threat of deployment as a sole factor for determining custody, resulting in our men and women who should be being honored for their service actually being disadvantaged for their service. I know that you know that this House has passed this in legislation form five times, four as part of the National Defense Authorization Act and once as part of a standalone bill. Um, your letter indicates that you'll be assigning your staff with the responsibility to negotiate language um, that can ultimately be enacted in legislation to provide that protection. This is a battle that's, that's been going on for, for five years now in legislation, and I know that you know this doesn't just affect our service members who are currently in custody battles, and we're not asking for them to be advantaged, we just don't want them to be disadvantaged, but it also affects our service members who have the stress of the concern that they may be subject to a custody battle and don't have a national standard of which they can have confidence. Many of these custody battles involve three states. Uh, the state in which the original custody order was issued, the state where the service member is currently assigned, and the state in which the child currently lives. So the, the uh, national standard is going to be so important to provide them that confidence. So um, my first question to you, and I have two other topics I, I want to get to, um, is uh, I believe that this should not wait for the National Defense Authorization Act this year. This House has passed it as a standalone bill. It has passed an in, on suspension on the House floor. Uh, we passed it four other times as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. If we roll up our sleeves, we can get this done and pass this very quickly through the House. Uh, and I'd like to have your support for us to get to work on this right away. We certainly will do that. Um, whether you can get it through the House in a hurry, I guess is up to you all. That would be excellent. Um, the second thing I want to talk to you about is uh, the issue of sexual assault. Um, in my district, um, we um, had a woman, Maria Lauterbach, who was tragically, tragically murdered after making allegations of sexual assault. I've worked with Jane Harmon and Representative Songus on provisions that we've gotten enacted over the past several years that address the issue of sexual assault. The New York Times article in, in reporting the lawsuit that has been filed identifies that the, um, the legislative accomplishments so far are modest. Uh, we actually had in this last National Defense Authorization Act uh, provisions that went to the issue of sexual assault, uh, one of which uh, would have provided a mechanism for expedited consideration and priority for base transfers for those who've been subject to sexual assault, another providing privileged communication between a victim and an assigned victim advocate. Uh, all of those did not make it into the final bill. Um, I just want to bring them to your attention and hope that we would have uh, DOD's support as we move to try to place those provisions in the National Defense Authorization Act uh, this year. Um, and then my third topic is uh, NNSA. I'm the chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Uh, one of the things that I've been concerned about with this continuing resolution process and then the upcoming fiscal year uh, 2012 budget is that NNSA being part of DOE has not been recognized as really being part of the defense infrastructure. Uh, so when people talk about cutting everything that is uh, non-security related, so many times they're missed and actually subject to a cut. 
As we look to the importance of an NSA and the additional funding that they need to respond to supporting our, our nuclear infrastructure, um, I'd appreciate your comments on certainly both their importance, the importance of this funding, and also the characterization that should be made that NNSA uh, is certainly part of our national security um, infrastructure and certainly uh, does very important defense work. Well, I would, I simply can endorse the last two statements. I mean, it, it is incredibly important and, um, and, and it clearly is intimately tied uh, to our national security. Uh, and should be regarded as part of the security um, uh, component. Just to add one point from a budgetary standpoint, in 13 to 16, we actually have some money in the defense budget, which on an annual basis will be transferred in NSA. The desire was to emphasize the partnership uh, between our two organizations. As the Secretary said, they are very important uh, to uh, meeting our nuclear needs. Excellent. Thank you both. Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Ms. Bordaio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary, and Admiral Mullen. Thank you for appearing today and providing us with your testimony as well as your service. Uh, first, um, I just have one simple question. I guess it would be an up and down answer. Um, I want to thank you for your support of uh, HR 44, the Guam War Claims Bill last you know, that was introduced last Congress. This proposed legislation is very important to the Chamorros on Guam who survived the brutal enemy occupation during World War II. Uh, although we were unsuccessful last Congress in the Senate, I have reintroduced the compromise version of H.R. 44, which eliminates the payment of claims to descendants of those that suffered personal injury during the occupation. Now, can we expect the same level of support from the Department of Defense as we did in the 111th Congress? The people of Guam, Mr. Secretary, are being asked to provide additional land for firing ranges and the main base area for the current buildup. And resolution of Guam war claims is going to be critical uh, to overcoming historical injustices. Well, as, uh, as Deputy Secretary Lynn testified, uh, we continue to support the Department of Justice uh, position on this. So I guess the answer would be yes. yes. My second question, I'm encouraged to see the administration continuing to support the so-called Guam International Agreement with military construction funding for the realignment of the Marines from Okinawa to Guam. I'm also encouraged by the funding of civilian infrastructure needs on Guam. Uh, my question is for Secretary Gates. Given the strategic importance of Guam and our nation's ongoing efforts to reshape our military presence in the Pacific theater, can you tell me what the status is of the Department of Defense's roadmap for realigning U.S. forces in Japan. Specifically, how is the reconfiguration of Camp Schwab facilities and the adjacent water surface areas to accommodate the Futenma replacement facility project proceeding? And when can we expect to see tangible progress on Okinawa for a Futenma replacement facility? My hope is that, well, first of all, I discussed this when I was in Japan uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, I, I feel like uh, the Japanese government is, is making a serious effort to resolve the Futenma issue. Um, my hope is that um, we will get resolution, particularly on the uh, configuration of the airfield or the runways, um, perhaps later this spring. And that would then allow us to go forward with our planning until, until we get uh, the Futema replacement facility issue settled, we really are not in a position to go forward. Uh, without resolution of that issue, uh, troops don't leave Okinawa, lands don't get returned to the Japanese, to the Okinawans. Uh, so these were points that I made both publicly and privately when I was in, when I was in Tokyo. And so my hope is that we will get a resolution of this to a sufficient point by uh, sometime later this spring that we then can go forward and, and work with this committee uh, in terms of that planning. And, and just to clarify a statement that I made to Mr. Thornberry, and I expect to be around for some months to be able to work with you on that. Well, good. That's good. All right. 
Uh, my third question is um, for either Secretary Gates or Chairman Mullen. I was pleased to see about 200 million in research and development for a next generation bomber. And I think this is a key platform in maintaining a robust long range strike capability. Can you explain the rationale behind your decision to build a long range manned bomber with the ability to penetrate defended airspace? And why is standoff insufficient to meet future combatant com command requirements? What are the inherent limitations within our existing legacy bomber fleet? Uh, actually, you almost, uh, uh, ma'am, said it in your question. Uh, uh, we actually went through a very, very rigorous debate and review and analysis to get to the conclusion that this should be, uh, uh, that we should invest in a new penetrating uh, stealth bomber. Um, and we think that capability is vital for the future. We certainly, certainly, uh, uh, there is great focus, obviously, on this with respect to uh, the Pacific. But in a lot of these capabilities that we've developed over the years, oftentimes even the area of focus that we might use it in changes. So w we think it's actually broader than that. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it was, um, uh, reviewed for both uh, its ability to be developed from evolving technology. So it goes to, I, I think there's a very smart acquisition strategy associated with this. This isn't going to be exquisite in every way. It's bounded uh, in cost, uh, and, and we think uh, terrific capabilities uh, that when combined uh, in the platform will actually uh, result in a revolutionary capability, not just an overall in terms of uh, our requirements. And this is... Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple other questions, but I'll enter them into the record. Thank you very much. Mr. Conaway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for uh, being here and your service, et cetera, et cetera, adding on. Uh, at the risk of a 15-yard penalty for piling on, I'm going to go back to the audit issue that, uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Forbes brought up. Um, it's not going to happen. I mean, neither one of you gentlemen, well, actually, none of the three of you will be in place when this gets done. Uh, that is inherent with the, t with the system that we have in place where uh, uh, it, no one's there. And that helps explain somewhat why we're not there. Is because unless it's a key component of what you want to get done, uh, it's not going to get done. I wish we had the same kind of commitment to auditing the Department of Defense's financial statements and or, or just, just the, the statement of receipts and disbursements that we have to greening uh, the military. I don't think greening the military is a core competency of the fight. Uh, but yeah, we're, you already heard testimony this morning about all the wonderful things we're done with respect to that. And you can't tell us what the differential in cost is between doing it that way versus what the standard way of it doing it. What, that, what did it cost us? Do we get a cost benefit for as uh, uh, Mr. Reyes said, uh, taking Fort Bliss off the grid. We don't know what that costs in those differentials. Um, the story in the Washington Post that uh, Ms. Sanchez mentioned where uh, folks who have uh, defrauded the government uh, have been awarded additional contracts for some $285 billion. That's an internal control issue. Internal controls are an integral part of a good financial system that allows you to know where your money's going and know where your money's not going. And so every time we have these kinds of stories, it adds to the um, confusion in the area. I go home to, to folks in West Texas, and when they find out the Department of Defense can't be audited, they are stunned. Uh, it's been on the books for a long, long time. And, and, and you know, Ms. Case, your uh, revelation that you got thousands of auditors and 10,000 lawyers was uh, kind of eye-opening for those of us on, on this side of the deal. I want to brag on the Marine Corps. They got very close this year. Uh, well, step back. Secretary Hale and I and, and his team and others, I've had extensive conversations with them, uh, briefings. Uh, I've you've, you've been over to the Pentagon and talked to them. They get it. They're working really hard. Um, but as Petraeus said last year, hard is not impossible. And as uh, Keith Alexander says, nothing's impossible for those who don't have to do it. And I'm one of those who don't have to do it, but, but you do. So I want to brag on the guys that are working. The Marine Corps is getting close. Um, but the question is, how do you leave a legacy, which you, everybody wants to leave good legacies, how do you leave a legacy in place that keeps this process moving, that you hand off, you get it so systemically 
ingrained into the team that this is important. We need to know where the money's going. We need to be able to, to have the quote unquote good housekeeping seal of approval so that uh, the general public gains additional confidence in the one entity in government that, the, that the, the general public generally has great confidence that, and that is, that's in the Department of Defense. Um, so how do you leave that legacy in place um, to, uh, to make sure that we don't lose ground because you're not gonna be responsible when 2017 rolls around and, and it's not done? Well, first of all, um, I think that um, uh, Mr. Hale and I have talked about this. Um, he has asked for my support in terms of communicating to the rest of the department that this is a high priority, and I have provided that support. Um, but to answer your question of how do I know that this will continue after I'm gone, that's because Mr. Hale will not be gone. <laughs> uh, and he will uh, continue in this, and he is committed to this, and I think he has uh, the plan in place, as I mentioned earlier, both short-term and longer-term, uh, in terms of getting us to a point where we are in compliance by 2017. Well, um, and, and I, we're gonna keep tracking it. Uh, I hope to be able to get the matrix in place so you can measure progress against that timeline, and we can see it as well. Um, but it also begs the question, you've got $100 billion of reprogramming money, in effect, dollars you say, your team has come together and said, we don't need to do $100 billion worth of this, we would rather do $100 billion worth of that uh, over that time frame. How are you gonna track that? How are you gonna make sure that that, that, that $100 billion of reprogramming doesn't morph into the $78 billion, the commitment to, to save the $78 billion uh, over these next time frame? Because uh, I, I can see very easily where you would wind up with a, uh, you fulfill the 78 number by siphoning off uh, numbers, monies that would have otherwise been reprogrammed into the, within the Department of Defense. Mr. Conway, I'd like to uh, offer a defense of the defense financial management system, uh, may be unpopular. First, I'm fully committed to audits. I understand we need them for public confidence. But the fact that we can't pass commercial audit standards does not mean we have no idea where we're spending the money that you send us. We've got 55,000 people in the defense community, financial community, they're well trained and that is one of their prime jobs as is the job of many others. We have several thousand auditors watching us uh, and I know that if we had no idea what we were uh, doing with the money, we would have a, we'd have rampant anti-deficiency act violations. Our, the, the, over the last five years, about two tenths of our budget has been associated with ADAs. That's more than I'd like, but it's pretty small. And it is smaller, I might add, uh, than the percentages of the non-defense agencies, who all of whom have clean audit opinions. So I think we do know what we're doing with the money you give us, and we can account for it. We can't pass commercial audit standards, and we need to do that as a, to reassure the public we're good stewards of their money, and I'm committed to doing it, and I'm working hard. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony today. I was at the first hearing after you were appointed. Uh, Secretary said I was a brand new member of Congress. I remember well um, the fact that you walked in and announced we were going to increase uh, end strength, which has been referred to here this morning. I also just would note that that was also the hearing where you announced that we were going to make a commitment to uh, MRAP deployment uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, which only a handful, relatively speaking, were in theater. Um, I, you know, I just want to share with you that last Easter, uh, there was a Connecticut National Guard uh, unit that was riding in an MRAP in Langham Province that uh, uh, unfortunately uh, a 200 pound uh, IED uh, was detonated. It lifted the uh, MRAP uh, many feet in the air, came crashing down. Um, everyone survived. There were some pretty bad injuries, but everyone is alive. There was no question that if a flat bottom Humvee had been uh, uh, part of that type of event, um, it wouldn't have been the case. I'm friends with one of the mothers of, of one of those soldiers who, um, you know, is a lawyer in practice in the New Haven area, and, you know, she said to me she didn't know what an MRAP was to M&M, and, uh, but she said whoever was responsible for making sure that um, those types of um, units were, were in the theater, um, just thank them for, for her, and I'm doing that publicly, and to you too, Admiral Mullen, because you were part of that. Um, extraordinary effort to finally get those things uh, over there to protect our troops, so thank you. Um, I want to just um, touch on two quick things that uh, people talk a little bit about in Connecticut, the uh, alternate engine. I was part of the debate last night. Um, 
And, and one of the comments that was made by Admiral Roughhead uh, last year when this issue came up was that um, aside from you know, the claims that the upfront production costs of a second engine would pay off over time, I mean, he pointed out the fact that on aircraft carriers, um, there is just no space capacity to deal with repairing and maintaining two separate uh, engine systems. Obviously, we have an admiral here who knows these uh, ships quite well, and I just wonder if you could sort of comment on the, you know, the, 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 I think, overstated claims of savings when you think about the operational headaches um, that a second engine would create. One of the things that we do in this town is we focus on getting stuff out the door as opposed to what it costs for life cycle. Uh, this uh, and certainly applies on aircraft carriers, but it applies actually in all three services. This is two separate lines, two separate training, two separate uh, maintenance manuals, two separate uh, uh, supply sources, all those kinds of things. And they lag each other significantly. I mean, I've been doing money a long time. I cannot make sense out of this second engine. It is two to three years behind. It's not going to compete, quite frankly. Uh, we cannot afford to buy the second engine, P I mean, from my perspective. Uh, and, and there have been multiple airplanes that are single engine airplanes that are single source. So I don't accept that 95% of the fleet's gonna go down at once. It just doesn't happen. We're better than that. Uh, if the, if the, you know, the first engine uh, will be, I think, more than adequate to meet the needs that we have for that airplane. And if I thought any different, I would, you know, be encouraging this engine, the second engine. I just categorically can't see that it's going to make any difference. It's going to cost us a lot of money, not just to get it out the door, but over the life uh, of its, uh, over the life cycle. And for the proponents who keep bringing up F-16, I mean, the fact is we're in a different world than 25 years ago as far as testing these engines, right? I mean, it's just the, the risk level yeah. is just not what it was. Absolutely. Then. Okay. And I just want to at least get your statement on the record on that. Well, and it's worth noting yeah. that uh, not only do the F-16 have a single source, but also the F-22, or the F-18, rather, have a single source, but also the F-22. And the F-135 engine is a derivative of the of the F-22 engine, so the likelihood of, of any kind of a serious design failure is very small. Thank you. Uh, real quick, I've only got a minute left, but I just want to at least note for the record again, a year ago we were talking about a $7 billion SSBN uh, submarine. Uh, obviously, milestone A, we've, we're now brought that figure down to $4.9 billion. Congratulations. Um, it's still, as you point out, going to be a, a long-term challenge for the shipbuilding budget. Admiral Roughhead makes the argument that it should be treated as a national strategic asset, which uh, I, I see you smiling because I think you smiled last time I asked you about this. Um, but the fact is, is I mean, you know, we, there is precedent with missile defense for, for treating it outside of a normal defense budget. And I, I just, that is a solution, isn't it, if, if, if we could figure out a way to make it happen? It's a third of the shipbuilding budget. Uh, I mean, if the shipbuilding budget has to absorb that, that's this year, uh, it would break the shipbuilding budget. And to the Secretary's point earlier about other, building other capabilities. Uh, that, that solution that you described has been talked about for years. Uh, but what it boils down to is obviously resourcing this, resourcing a shipbuilding plan, which is going to get us to 313 and beyond. And with the SSBN arrival, that's not going to happen. Uh, so. How you resource it is the question. One way to do it is, is literally at the national level as opposed to inside a, the service budget, but it's a huge challenge uh, just because of the, the money that we're going to have to devote to it. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Gates, Chairman Mullen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your service. I want to begin with Chairman Mullen and follow up on my colleague's question concerning shipbuilding. As you know, if you go back to 2006, uh, the shipbuilding plan there said 313 ships, and we've heard that number year after year after year. We find ourselves today with 286 ships. We find ourselves with an aging class of Perry frigates that are going to be phasing out. We find ourselves with six Los Angeles-class submarines that are 30 years or older. We find ourselves in a, an environment with a very, very high ops tempo, uh, putting ships to sea. Uh, pushing maintenance schedules, pushing uh, life cycle capability uh, management elements. My question is this, is it anywhere in the spectrum of reality that we will have a 313 ship Navy 
And, and if so, how are we going to integrate these older ships that are coming to the end of their service lives in making sure that we're building at a pace where we are building more ships than what we're retiring? And as you know now, we're at a pace where we're retiring more ships than what we're bringing into the fleet. And I just wanted to get your perspective on that. Well, actually, this, this budget, which is, I think, 10 ships and $15 billion, is, is uh, not insignificant compared to where we, where we were a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, secondly, I've been someone that I believe we have to uh, uh, get ships to their service life. That's an easy thing to yeah. say. It's hard to do because yeah. you have to make that investment over the course of uh, ship service life, and oftentimes the Navy uh, hasn't done that specifically. Yeah. What gets lost in this discussion about the number of ships that we have, uh, and I actually, as a CNO, did the analysis that created the minimum level for the Navy of 313 ships. But it was my belief back then we were on a we were on a glide slope to get to 220 or 230 or 240 because it was just out of control going down because of the cost and lots of other things the numbers of ships that we were going to have to be uh, decommissioned. So it's it's not at 313, but it actually has grown, and I think we have to just keep keep heading in that direction. That is key. Number of ways to do that. Uh, so and and the, as the secretary has spoken, and he and I have talked about this many times. You know, as these wars wind down, we're going to, I think, have to depend more and more on our Air Force and our Navy in the world that we're living in. And so how do we make those investments? Because what gets lost in the discussion here is their op tempo has been pretty high. I mean, we talk about the op tempo for the Army and the Marine Corps mm -hmm. absolute, and the Special Forces. That's at the top. I understand that. That's the toughest op tempo. But if you look at the op tempo of the Air Force and the Navy since 9 it's up as well. And it wasn't, you know, they weren't. Yeah, you know, they weren't sitting back at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So we are wearing them out, and we have to focus on that. Those modernization programs, they provide an enormous strategic capability for us, given the world that we're living in, we have to invest in as well. Mm -hmm. are, are you in a position to make the commitment to make sure that on life cycle management that you are doing everything, including the inspection programs, to make sure they're robust, and the financial commitment to make sure these ships get to the yard on time, because as you know, any little glitch in the schedule there really affects uh, a, a sub zero. Are, are, is the commitment there to make sure that, that we're going to get to the end of the service life of these ships, to make sure that we're keeping that, that three, or getting, have some chance of getting to the, to the 330? Before the chairman answers that question, may I say that if we end up with a year-long continuing resolution, <laughs> those ships are not going to make it into maintenance. Okay. Um, yeah. I also, actually, just to the, the CR, I was struck that it, you lose a DDG and a, and a submarine. I, we, we work for years to get to two submarines a year, and literally within a few months it falls out. You're not going to get that back, certainly in this budget. Uh, this is really a discussion better had by Admiral Ruffhead specifically. Yeah. Uh, I know the Navy has invested more to, to, in terms of its maintenance uh, in order to sustain or, or get to, mm -hmm. to extended life. That said, he's also made a decision to decommission some ships before that so that he can invest in some of the ships that he thinks he needs for the future. Secretary, I want to follow up quickly with you. We talk about the QDR being issued of the National Military Strategy. In their current projections, do they keep in mind where end strength may be with your projections about reducing end strength for both the Marine Corps and the Army in, in how, those, uh, in, in how the, the QDR estimates that in the National Military Strategy? Yes, they do. They do. They do. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, um, we have a very strong agreement on the CR. We have a very strong disagreement on the second engine. Um, I, in my district, it doesn't matter. So I, I don't have a parochial interest in this, but I do have a strong opinion. But I would like to ask you, you both said this is your last hearing. I could probably say with great certainty that none of us, none of the three of us will be here in 10 years. How long are we going to be buying the engine for the F-35? Well, I would say over the course of two, two to three decades. Okay, so 20, 30 years. Right. 10 years from now, if we have decided on the one engine, if for whatever reason the company comes to us and says, I have to raise my costs substantially, what do you do? I'm, actually, I look at it, uh, I mean, I, you're getting at the competition piece, and I understand. I am. It. But uh, as I look at, let me, let me shift to. I, uh, let me, can I just. F-18. I'm, I'm 
you get rate and you get savings by production levels. Do we That's have how you create it? Do we have a fixed cost on this, or will they, being the sole source engine, be able to raise their prices ten years out? I actually think the I, I think with the kind of production line we're talking about, they'll come down. We hope, sir. Ms. Songus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for your uh, testimony and your very thorough responses to our many diverse questions. I'd like to come back again to the issue of sexual assault in the military. Uh, it's obviously one that's much in the news today, but really has been a long-standing issue, and I think, as Representative Turner mentioned, something that this committee has worked hard uh, to deal with and find a way forward. But despite that, despite, and we've heard testimony from the various services as to all their efforts, uh, but despite that, in 2010, there were 3,230 reported sexual assaults in the military. But by the Pentagon's own estimate, as few as 10% of sexual assaults were reported. And the VA estimates that one in three women veterans report experiencing some form of military sexual trauma. I can uh, remember several years ago meeting with some people active uh, in the VA in the state of Massachusetts and having a gentleman comment, comment and say that that was one of their uh, dominant issues that they had to deal with. The fiscal year 2007, 2011 Defense Authorization Act requ required that the department look into the feasibility of providing a military lawyer to all victims of sexual assault. While this is a good first step, I was disappointed that provisions which guarantee all victims the right to legal counsel and protect the confidentiality of conversations between victims and victim advocates were not included in the final version of the 2011 NDAA, though they were in the House version. We would be shocked if conversations between their client or advocate were not privileged in the civilian world. And similar rights must be afforded to service members who may be the victim of a crime. Why would the department resist such a common sense measure? And I ask this of Secretary uh, Gates. Well, I hadn't realized the department had resisted it. And um, I must say, along with um, Mr. Turner's comments, uh, these things sound to me uh, like uh, reasonable uh, actions. And so I will take out of this hearing um, the charge to look into whether, um, why, if, if we opposed it, why we opposed it. And, and why we should not go forward on our own even without uh, legislation. And I would appreciate, um, once you do that, of uh, getting back to me in some form so th that I and others who felt this was very important. I mean, one of the things we have found is that despite uh, all the good efforts on the part of the services, that the, the follow-up procedures after illegally um, do not support, undermine all the efforts you have made around sort of preventing this in the first place, uh, providing access to medical care, but if the follow-up legal processes do not sufficiently uh, uh, protect the victim, make them feel comfortable in coming forward, that it undermines all the good work you've done. They become suspect of the entire process, feel very much at risk. And this was one very common sense way going forward in the legal process alone that uh, we felt we could better protect uh, victims as they try to assert their rights. This is one of the reasons why we've invested, as I mentioned earlier, over the last couple of years, almost $2 million in training our prosecutors. We found that uh, when I started looking into this several years ago that, that uh, the defendants hire lawyers who are specialized in this area and our prosecutors tended to be not have that specialty. And it, and it is complex law, and it is difficult to prosecute successfully, uh, particularly if you don't have the right training. And so that's one of the reasons we've undertaken that. And, and as I say, we've expanded the, the, um, uh, the victim advocate uh, program uh, dramatically from about 300 to 3,000 uh, around the world over the last few years. 
uh, in every base and installation, and and uh, I will I will press on the question of, of why we cannot assure confidentiality. And the other issue we've learned too is as all the services have dealt with this, you've done this in your each has done it in its own way, reflective of its culture and different processes. That becomes very difficult to oversee as a member of Congress. So in the defense authorization bill, we asked for a, a comprehensive approach across all the services, and I know. Uh, that the Defense Department is working on that, and we look forward uh, to uh, what you come up with. So thank you both. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and first of all, thank you so much for the uh, great job that both of you have done uh, on behalf of uh, our country. Um, let, me, let me first thank you uh, for standing firm uh, on the issue about the second engine uh, for the F-35. I, th I just think that um, we've got to make some tough decisions uh, with limited resources, and that's certainly one of them that I, that I think is wasteful uh, that uh, I certainly support you on. Uh, also, uh, uh, in your position on the um, Combined Forces Command, uh, Joint Forces Command, I think that its time is gone, and, and I certainly support you uh, in that effort. But in terms of looking at the, I'm, I'm concerned about still the top-heavy nature uh, of the Department of Defense, and I, and I noted that uh, right now I think we have 268 ships, if that's the proper number, um, I believe it is. We have uh, 253 admirals right now. That's almost one admiral per ship, um, and I think that the Navy is authorized to go 283 admirals. And so um, can, you, can you tell me, give me some more visibility as to what could be done to, uh, to, to try and uh, uh, streamline uh, the military? Well, one of the things that we've done as part of the efficiencies effort is uh, we have eliminated out of 900 flag rank um, officers in the military, uh, we will eliminate 100 uh, general officer positions uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, we're also, uh, and that includes admirals. <laughs> and. Uh, and we also uh, will be eliminating uh, somewhere over 200 uh, senior uh, civilian executive positions. So I was asked earlier about the $11 billion for rebaselining OSD and the defense agency and so on. That's where a lot of those positions are coming from. Uh, but we're also downgrading positions. We're not only eliminating positions, we're downgrading a number. For example, the component commanders in Europe will be downgraded from four stars to three stars, except for the Navy, because there's a NATO connection on that side, and, and that, so that'll take longer. But we're trying to come at it both from the standpoint of, is the level of flag rank officer for the job right, and given passage of history, and, and can we get rid of these positions? And we've done so on both civilian and uniform side. Well, well thank you. Yeah, if I can just briefly, uh, and this is, this is inside baseball, but I think it's uh, one of the things I told the Secretary when we started to review this is, you know, when budgets get tight, people start taking shots at how many admirals and generals are. That's, that's historic. What the Secretary led was a very thorough review, and actually the services did this, uh, a, a very thorough review of need, you know, what level for what job, and that will continue, that will continue to go on. Uh, there's also, at least over the course of the last 15 years for me, all of which I've been uh, an admiral, there, far beyond anything I expected, believe me, uh, there's also just an, an, a growing uh, complexity that, that requires some level of senior and ex civilian and, uh, and uh, uniform leadership in the world that we're living in. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for, for the reductions that make sense, but too often it is also a very easy target, and I just would like as we have tried to be to be careful about it. Well, thank you. It's um, it's an easy target, and, and uh, I certainly think it's willing one willing to take. Let me uh, let me talk about um, f what is the Department of Defense doing in terms of re-examining um, our 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 foreign basing commitments or or our our forward presence uh, in terms of whether or not it's necessary. And let me refer. We right now we have twenty eight thousand five hundred. Uh, U.S. personnel, I believe, in, in the, on the Korean Peninsula in South Korea. Um, it seems that when the North Koreans get upset, it's when we do the major joint military exercises. And when we look at our allies across the globe, can't we better demonstrate um, our support 
uh, for our commitments with them uh, by doing periodic joint military exercises uh, in, in for, for instance, uh, four brigade combat teams in Europe. Um, at this point in time, is, is that really necessary? So I'm wondering if, if there's been an ongoing analysis to determine the cost effectiveness of redeploying uh, those forces back to the United States. Uh, we have spent a lot of time on this. We have, we have just completed a global posture review, uh, examining our um, positioning in Europe, our position in, um, in the Pacific, and also in the Middle East. Um, it's, it's now uh, being discussed in the interagency because obviously there are political implications for, for any changes. But I would tell you that we've examined this very closely and, and we, will, we will probably make some adjustments. I think I mentioned in a speech that uh, our force structure as well as our rank structure in Europe uh, is still a legacy from, uh, from the Cold War. But that said, I, I am a firm believer that our forward posture uh, in Europe, in Asia, is fundamental to our alliance relationships. Uh, it provides them with the assurance that in fact we will be there and we will support them. And I think dramatic changes in our overseas posture uh, would be very destabilizing uh, to a lot of these relationships. And I think that one of the reasons that, for example, South Korea and Japan uh, have not tried to develop nuclear weapons of their own is because of their confidence that our presence in their country provides a tripwire and a guarantee that if they are attacked, the United States will support them. Thank you. Ms. Pingree. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony today and uh, for your service. I appreciate it. And uh, a couple of things I, I also want to uh, tell you I appreciate your stand on the second engine and uh, also was glad to hear your explanation and your thoughtful remarks about the continuing resolution um, coming from the state of Maine where people pay a lot of attention to the construction of DDGs. Um, we're very interested in what's going to happen there, so I appreciate your bringing all of our attention to the importance of uh, the challenges of a, a continuing resolution. And I also want to thank you for your remarks to uh, Representative Songus. I, too, am very concerned about some of the issues around sexual harassment and uh, am concerned that we haven't moved far enough. So I'm glad you've taken her charge and uh, think particularly uh, now that we have increased dependence on women in the military, we have to be very respectful of the issues that they're raising and the fact that it hasn't changed sufficiently to make uh, women comfortable um, at serving their country. But um, my question is somewhat different. You brought this up earlier, and uh, I want to talk about TRICARE. Uh, as you know, and uh, you stated, um, U.S. Family Health Care Plan, designed by Congress in 96, provides the full TRICARE prime benefit for military beneficiaries in 16 states and D.C. Uh, for over 115,000 beneficiaries. Beneficiaries are highly satisfied with this option. I come from Maine, as I said. Um, in Maine, it's uh, administered by Martins Point Healthcare, and they have a, a customer satisfaction rating of 93%. I've visited their facility. They stress preventative care. It's exactly the model that we want for healthcare um, in this country. As you've already mentioned, the President's budget request has a huge proposed change that would preclude enrollment in U.S. Family Health Plan for beneficiaries who reach 65 years of age, and if we enact that, it would immediately force over 3,000 military beneficiaries to disenroll from the plan cho they've chosen. Um, first, I think this recommendation contradicts President Obama's position regarding health care reform, healthcare reform, that you should be able to keep the plan you have if you're happy with it, but perhaps a greater concern, you mentioned um, a cost savings, this proposal would have a cost saving for DOD, but it really just shifts the cost to the Department of Health and Human Services. So I don't see how overall we are anticipating a cost savings as a whole, and I think it's going to be very detrimental to the beneficiaries. So can you address my concerns on this? Let me respond. First, there would be some net savings to the government because we are paying these hospitals at significantly higher than Medicare rates. And part of the goal of this overall effort is that we treat all the hospitals uh, similarly in terms of the, of the rate paying. But I also want to clarify, yes, we would, uh, as people reached age 65, they would need to join TRICARE for Life. They could stay at the hospital where they're being treated. 
They wouldn't be required to, uh, to leave that. They could use that as their primary uh, provider, but they would need to do what every other retired does in the Department of Defense when they reach age 65, and that is join the TRICARE for Life program. So we're trying to treat everybody the same. Uh, yes, there would be savings modest to the government, and you're right, there are some costs shifted to Medicare, uh, but there's a net savings because we would now be paying Medicare rates and we're paying much higher. Also want to work with the hospitals involved. We're not looking to reduce the quality of care. We're phasing this in very slowly. Uh, it would be everybody in the program now is grandfathered, or grandmothered. Uh, it's only as you come into the program, so there'd be a very gradual change. And our goal is to be sure these hospitals, are, that their care is not harmed. So just to follow up, it's my understanding that Public Law 104-201, Section 726B, which I'm sure you're well aware of, um, mandates that government cannot pay more for the care of U.S. family health care plan enrollee than it would if a beneficiary were receiving care from other government programs. So it seems to me that we should already be paying equivalent of what Medicare costs are. And again, I would just stress, based on observing my own TRICARE program, and I don't have any particular stake in it, but having been very involved in the health care debate, knowing how important preventative care is, knowing that there's very high customer satisfaction with that, but also it's a different model of care, I'm just greatly concerned with shifting people out of that model if it doesn't really result in cost shaving savings and if it's only a cost shift. I mean, for us, I know you have to look at your budget, but we have to look at uh, the overall cost here. And if it's just going over to Medicare and it's not a significant savings, and it goes back to an old model of care, not a new preventative model of care, I don't think we've improved care for these families. Well, we need to get with you. I'm not familiar with the details of the provisions. I do know that there are some requirements we are not meeting in the Seoul Community Hospitals with regard to Medicare rates, and that may be that we're also proposing to move toward that, uh, toward a, a Medicare rate. So we need to get back to you on the details. There would be some modest net savings to the government. We work carefully with OMB, uh, and they fully support this uh, proposal in terms of, the, of shifting the funds. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I would be happy to follow up with you on that, so thanks. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral, Mr. Secretary, sorry that I missed uh, the last hour of testimony. I had to vote and mark up. Um, first, first question is this, Mr. Secretary, uh, Ms. Davis, my colleague from San Diego, you were answering her questions. You talked about the defense budget. You talked about the total uh, layouts and how this is, is the lowest point since the 90s, since before World War II, where we're at the low part where we're at now, where there is so little being spent on, on defense. And, and I would argue and ask your opinion of this, if, if you don't give us a top line, if you don't ask for, uh, for what it would cost to erase all risk, literally, or as much risk as possible, then we have no baseline to cut defense from or to add to, really, because the numbers that we're using are limbo numbers. Really, because if you were to fully fund defense, that this is my question, if you were to fully fund defense and take away 100% as, as best as you could, 100% of, of, uh, of risk using your own threat assessment tools and analysis, what would that funding be? What would you ask for? I have only half jokingly said in meetings in the department that if we had a trillion dollar budget, I would still have unfunded requirements. Yeah, that's right. Um, the services would still be able to come up with a list of things that they really need. Uh, I think that the budget that we've provided at uh, $553 billion for FY12 um, mitigates risk uh, to the extent uh, that, um, that I think is, is reasonably possible. Uh, and, and I think that we have uh, we are investing in new capabilities. The $70 billion that the services are going to be able to invest from their savings in new capabilities in, in, or in added numbers, I think, help mitigate that risk. Um, you can never reach a point, just as there is no such thing as perfect security, there is no such thing as eliminating risk. Mr. Secretary, if if I may, I'm going to run out of time, and I have one more totally separate question. If you got to your that highest point that you could, where you started getting diminished rate of uh, return, what would that number be, roughly? I I think that we are at a point with the 553 where we can do that. Okay, so fully funding defense and every requirement is at 553. 
we we will never fund every request. But if you did, sir, what I'm asking is what I is have no roughly? idea how much. You money haven't thought is. about what it would cost to really nobody satisfy lives in the that, requirements. Nobody of lives all the in that world. Services? No, but but what you're supposed to do is tell us how do we how we get to zero threat and Congress then and I'm telling you what to fund. You you are never going to get to zero threat. Well, you we could spend try, two right? trillion dollars and you'll never get to zero threat. But that's what we would like to hear from you, Mr. Secretary. Is that I'm it would cost two trillion dollars and we could cut that by seventy five percent and here we are at the five fifty. Right. On a totally separate note, let's talk about Iraq for a minute. Um, if they, if the status of forces agreement is, is not changed, uh, and or the I, I, Iraqis don't ask for our help and ask us to stay, what is our plan for 2012? At the, at the end of this year, what's going to happen? We will have all of our uh, forces out of uh, out of Iraq. We will have an office of security cooperation for Iraq that will have probably on the order of uh, 150 to 160. Department of Defense employees and uh, several hundred contractors who are working FMS cases. Do you think that that represents uh, the the uh, correct approach for this country after the blood and treasure that we've spent in Iraq? My own personal time of two tours in I Iraq, there's going to be fewer people there than that, that 150 than there are in Egypt right now. It's somewhere around six, 700. Um, of those same types of folks in Egypt. How can we maintain uh, the, all of these gains that we've uh, made through uh, so much effort if we only have 150 people there and we don't have any military there whatsoever? We'd have more military in uh, Western European countries at that point than we have in Iraq, one of the most central states, as everybody knows, uh, in the Middle East. Well, I think that there is, uh, there is certainly on our part an interest in having uh, an additional presence and, and the truth of the matter is the Iraqis are going to have um, some uh, problems that they're going to have to deal with if, they're, if we are not there in some numbers. They will not be able to do the kind of job in intelligence fusion. They won't be able to protect their own airspace. Uh, they, um, they, will not, they will have problems with logistics and maintenance. But it's their country. It's a sovereign country. This is the agreement that was signed by President Bush uh, and the Iraqi government, and we will abide by the agreement unless the Iraqis uh, ask us to uh, have additional people there. Thank you. Mr. Garamendi. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary, and uh, Admiral Mullen. Thank you so very much for uh, your forthright and uh, very uh, compelling arguments. First, I want to uh, compliment you on going green. The Navy's doing extraordinary things, as are the other forces, uh, and it's very, very important on your energy programs. I hope you continue that. I encourage you to do so, and uh, many of us around here will do everything we can to support that effort. My question, however, goes to uh, the Afghanistan war uh, and Pakistan. And uh, it, the question is this. Uh, does our war in Afghanistan destabilize Pakistan? And if so, what should we be doing about that problem in Pakistan? I don't believe that um, the war in Afghanistan is destabilizing to Pakistan. <clears throat> I think that um, what is destabilizing to Pakistan, among other things, is uh, a group of uh, terrorist uh, uh, several terrorist organizations in the western part, northwestern part of Pakistan uh, that are uh, intent on destabilizing Pakistan and overthrowing its government. And I think our efforts combined with the Pakistani efforts on both sides of the border, uh, in fact, help reduce that terrorist risk uh, to the Pakistanis. Uh, I think that extreme uh, economic problems uh, are uh, a huge factor in Pakistan. So I don't, I don't think our presence in Afghanistan is destabilizing. In fact, I think it helps the Pakistanis long term. I'll let it go at that. Uh, I would, I'm certainly not going to place my knowledge and intelligence ahead of yours, but uh, there seems to be considerable others who would question that. Uh, that conclusion. Admiral? Sir, I mean, I would say this is not a very stable region. I mean, that's part of the problem we have. Al-Qaeda lives there. Leadership lives there. They're still trying to 
kill as many Americans and Western citizens as they can. There are multiple terrorist organizations, uh, I call it the epicenter of terrorism in the world, that are now uh, working much more closely together than they have historically. So it's, uh, from my perspective, it, we, I've tried to talk about this as a region as opposed to one country or another. They are, they are very much uh, uh, integrated in ways that sometimes they don't even like, but clearly they are. Uh, and so it's, I think we have to have, uh, and we seek, you know, a strategic partnership with both these countries, really the region, to, to look at long-term stability there. That's, from my perspective, uh, uh, whether, we're, whether we're at war at the level we're at right now or in the future, when we have far fewer troops uh, in the area, can we support stability in a way that doesn't endanger us in the long run, in addition to the citizens of those two countries. I, I thank you. I, I don't want to engage in a debate with you, but, so I'll let it go at that, and thank you for that information. My final question has to do with missile defense, which is significantly augmented in the budget. Why? Part of the uh, half billion dollar increase is to uh, implement the phased adaptive array um, uh, missile defense that we have agreed to in uh, uh, in Europe, but also, frankly, to uh, to increase our ability to defend our our ships and our troops against um, theater level uh, uh, threats, uh, missile threats. Uh, Hezbollah alone has 40,000 rockets and missiles at this point, including uh, anti-ship cruise missiles that have a range of 65 miles. So we, we are putting more money into Aegis-capable ships. Uh, we will have 41 of these by the end of 2016, 28 by the end of uh, 2012. They defend our ships. They defend, um, uh, they have the potential to defend our ground troops. We're developing additional uh, generations of the standard missile three uh, that have enhanced capabilities uh, to deal with Iranian, North Korea, and other kinds of missiles. And we're making baseline, uh, continuing to make baseline investments in the ground-based interceptor program, which protects the continental United States. So I think all of these uh, are contributing to um, our own security, uh, but also um, help protect our allies as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ridgell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, Secretary Gates, Secretary Hale, and Admiral Mullen. Um, in your chain of command, uh, many, many levels down is my son, and uh, I just want you to know, um, uh, on behalf of the Second District of Virginia, as this is, if it is in fact your your last testimony before the House Armed Services Committee, that we're just really deeply, deeply grateful for your service. I know you sacrificed a lot, and your families have to allow you to serve in the way that you, that you have. I know you're doing everything you can to accomplish the mission and to protect our young people. I thank you for that. I uh, come from a private sector background, and I've learned in life that uh, communication is extraordinarily difficult, and it's absolutely essential uh, for an organization to succeed. And I don't speak for the committee, but just for myself, it, it sure seems to me that uh, communication between the DOD and uh, HASC is uh, lacking. It's, um, it's poor. I, I regret that I have to rate it that way. It's acute in our own district, in the second district of Virginia, with respect to uh, the, the disestablishment of JEFCOM. Um, even today, uh, I've yet to receive the detailed analysis, the supporting documents that would help me representing the second district to properly understand and respond to the disestablishment of JEFCOM, and that's disappointing to me, and, and I, I trust that we'll move forward uh, both on the HAS side and on uh, the Pentagon side to improve sharply uh, communication. Um, one area that I'd like to shift to here is TRICARE, and uh, it's widely understood when someone enlists in the military that uh, health care is for life, it's free. I, I've, I've asked many people, I, I served in the Marine Corps Reserve myself, and just, just in, it's widely understood. And so as tempting as it is to look at that area as an area for cost savings, I truly believe, and I don't use these words lightly, that it is a, it is a breach of trust 
to change the deal because maybe we don't like the deal or the government doesn't like the deal. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Admiral Mullen, what initiative, if any, is being undertaken to ensure a, a more full disclosure uh, to those who are considering a military career with respect to benefits that may be offered at their retirement? Uh, I don't think, uh, uh, honestly, uh, when young people come in the military, uh, they're 20-something, 17, 18, 19 years old, uh, and certainly while the material is available um, and, and recruiters may use this as something uh, in terms of, you know, a, a health care plan, and I've talked about it to our young people forever, I think that the military health care plan is the gold standard in the country, quite frankly. Uh, um, but uh, it is not something, at least I have found, uh, in those on active duty they focused heavily on, more so recently than in the past, but it is not something they focus on uh, when they're that young. I didn't, um, and many others haven't. Admiral, uh, uh, with all due respect, I just, my, my time is so short. Um, let me, I, but I, there is yes. a larger point, so let me respond to this. Congress actually settled this issue in 1995 that it wasn't free for life. Well, they imposed fees, and they imposed a fee of $460 a year. So, so the issue of whether it was free or not was settled by the Congress in 1995. Once you've acknowledged that there is going to be a fee, the notion that the fee would never change is certainly nowhere in the legislation. Well, Mr. Secretary, my question was, uh, what initiative, if any, was undertaken to ensure a full disclosure of those who are entering the service. I, I believe in full disclosure, I know we all do. And I'm submitting to you today that in countless conversations with our veterans, that there is a disconnect between what is being told by the recruiter and, and what reality is. And I, I just respectfully, as one American to another, am asking uh, that that be addressed within the commands. I, it's not, a, it's not an, ex, uh, an expensive initiative, it would just be to, ensure better disclosure. You know, as we look, and I'll close with this, we look at the, the profound challenges that are facing our military that you've discussed today and um, the, the shortage uh, of funds for ship repair, for shipbuilding, uh, the reduction in end strength, uh, troop levels. It is just stunning to me that, and I think a misplaced priority that we are still talking about uh, sending a carrier to Mayport, which is a risk that is minimal and could be mitigated uh, with just far less funds than it takes to move that uh, carrier to Mayport. And I'd ask you to reconsider that respect, respectfully. Thank you. Ms. Hanabusa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, Admiral, for being here. I have a basic question regarding the budget. I read, um, and I thought I read it correctly in the budget documents from the President, that the total amount of outlay was about 700 billion, and I do know the 553 is the base budget, and Mr. Secretary has said that, and the overseas contingency operation budget of about 117 plus or minus, I think is not included in the base, if I'm reading that correctly, but I'm still short about 30 billion. So do you know where that 30 billion is? I, I need to get with you and see where the numbers are. There are various ways of, of uh, adding up the budgets. The figures we're discussing here are 051. Um, you could be including the uh, National Nuclear Security Administration figures in there, which is something called function 050. I don't know if we want to take a lot of time here, but I'd be glad to get with you and we'll sort out the numbers for please, you. Please do, but the 553 and the 117 is correct, though. So we're, yes. we're not really that just talking about a that's the DOD billion. portion of the budget, but okay. as I say, there are various ways of adding this up. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, I'm, um, uh, Congresswoman Bordalio has left, but I am also very curious about the position with Okinawa, and I've read your, your uh, what was given to us, uh, beginning on page 15 and continuing on to page 16. There seems to not be a firm statement about what Japan's position is, and I think one of the things that's pointed out is that the 472 million for Guam was not included in, the, I guess, the Japanese uh, budget. So how critical is their contribution to what happens 
And I, I kind of would like to know as best as I can, what's the bottom line? Are, are they going to move from Okinawa? Are they not going to move? Are we? It looks like a reduction of about 10,000 troops from Okinawa. Uh, so what, what do we plan to do? First of all, the, um, the Japanese actually have uh, fulfilled all their commitments to date. They've um, given us, I think, a little over $700 million for infrastructure. Uh, when I was there, they told me they were putting together a program that will include something on the same order of uh, further infrastructure investments. In and as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we really can't go forward on Guam. And in fact, the Congress has withheld money uh, for going forward on Guam until we have greater clarity on what happens on Okinawa. My hope is, based on my conversations in Japan, uh, that we will have some resolution of this uh, by later this spring or early summer, and then we will be able to come to you with our plans. But, but absent, absent resolution of the Futenma replacement facility uh, issue, uh, our troops aren't coming out of Okinawa, land is not being returned to the Okinawans, uh, and we have to sort of uh, start all over again. But, but we, I, I do believe we will uh, find some uh, positive resolution to the Futemba issue. So when you say the Futemba issue and uh, the resolution of where the troops are going to go, are you talking about within Okinawa itself or some variation of Okinawa and Guam? Uh, on Okinawa itself. On Okinawa itself. And finally, um, this whole cons concept of end strength. I want to know whether that's some kind of a magical number into the future to a time specific, or is that something that we're looking at given the information that we have today? It's basically looking at the information that we have today. And as, I, as I've said, the, the, the end strength in 2015 and 2016 uh, will at the end of the day be determined by the conditions in the world. And uh, above all, have we come out of Afghanistan, by and large, uh, by the end of 2014, uh, that, that would enable us to, uh, to have a lower uh, end strength? Now, as we've, as we've talked about in this hearing, the Marine Corps believes that it needs to come down um, about 15,000. And because they think they've gotten too big and too heavy in terms of their equipment. So this is a proposal that actually is divorced from the budget and is more based on the Marine Corps' own view of their force structure and what they need to complete their mission going forward. And how about the other services? Do they share what The only other service for? affected at this point is the Army. And um, uh, again, depending on the circumstances, the, the Army leadership supports this proposal. Uh, but the Army leadership is also fully aware that they'll have the opportunity to revisit this decision if uh, conditions in the world change. Thank you. We, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five members that uh, have been waiting patiently now for three hours, and we just got the first series of votes called, and I'm, I'm concerned that they will go for uh, 45 minutes uh, or an hour. And I know, Ms. Secretary, you said that you had till 1.30. I appreciate uh, that you have given us that time, but I think we only have time probably for, for one more. Mr. Gibson. Thank you, Chairman. And I thank the uh, distinguished panelists uh, for uh, their leadership and for being here today. And I also want to express my, uh, my admiration uh, for all the men and women that you lead and for their families on what they do uh, on behalf of our freedom. I'd also like to express my appreciation for the budget submission. Uh, not easy work, and I have some experience in it, and I know it's been challenging uh, for the team, uh, especially in relation to the last decade with regard to prioritization. I look forward to being supportive going forward. My concern has been touched on here today, but I'd like to address it more directly. And it has to do with, uh, generally, uh, requirements and resources, but, but more broadly, uh, with the prefacing uh, discussion of what kind of country we are, what interests we are, what commitments we think uh, are appropriate for a republic. You know, I think on this committee there would be wide agreement and beyond that we need to protect our cherished way of life and that we need the world's best military to do that. 
But I think there's a wide variety of views and opinions as to precisely what that means. Uh, some, some believe that we should uh, embrace some kind of isolationism. Uh, others, uh, perhaps uh, a near endless uh, global commitment strategy. Uh, I reject uh, the extremes of both sides. I personally think that we're overcommitted and we ask too much of our military, but it's a debatable point, which gets to my point. We have uh, processes, NDP, the QDR, primarily for internal or DC consumption, when I think it really needs to be more of a national conversation. I know you both uh, travel widely and you speak. I'm curious to know, does this topic come up uh, when you're with the American people? And what ideas that you have, if you agree, that this should be more of a national discussion going forward? Well, I'm, I've traveled fairly extensively over the course of the last year, and, and I have uh, found uh, and I worry about uh, the sort of growing disconnect between the American people and the military. And I don't mean that I mean, they're enormously supportive of the men and women in our families. Uh, they know we're in two wars. They know we're sacrificing uh, enormously as well. But they are uh, more and more. We come from 40 percent fewer places. I mean, we're 40 percent smaller than we were in 1989. Uh, we have bracked out of many parts of the country, and so our day-to-day -day connections are significantly reduced from what they used to be. And, and it's the breadth and the depth of understanding of who we are and what we're doing, the number of deployments, sacrifices to the family, the changes that have occurred over the course of the last decade. So it is a, it, it is a it's not going to happen overnight, but it is a long-term concern that I have, and particularly when you overlay that with the enormous fiscal challenges that the country has right now. It's one of the reasons I've talked about, you know, I actually do think the debt's a hugely important issue for national security, because we're going to be affected by that. You can see it in this budget. It's going to, it's going to continue to happen. Um, so that's probably the worry, and having a conversation with uh, America about those challenges, and particularly individuals who serve, then go on to return to communities throughout the country, the veterans' issues. I mean, we see an increasingly homeless population in our veterans, increasing number of female homeless veterans, for example. How do they return to you pick the area? Uh, they're enormously capable people. They, they are wired to serve in the future. They'll make a big difference. They're 20-something. But how do we invest just a little bit in them so that taking advantage of the GI Bill, they will then take off and make a huge difference in the future? And I think they will. That connection is something that I think is really important. But at the end of the day, Mr. Gibson, from our perspective, the dialogue, the conversation that, that you're describing is a dialogue that needs to take place between the executive branch and the legislative branch. You represent the American people. Um, you have your finger on the pulse of the people in your district better than any of us ever could. And, and so, as was intended by the founders, we basically rely on you as the surrogates for the American people uh, in terms of that dialogue. Well, I appreciate the comments, and I do believe that it is an area that we're going to need to address, uh, and I look forward to working uh, with the DOD and also the chairman and the committee moving forward, and I yield back. Thank you very much, and Mr. Secretary, uh, Admiral, thank you again for being here and for your service, and uh, this committee stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.